I think I'll just say good morning and welcome. This is the Phoenix Seventh-day Baptist Church, and just so glad to have folks here today. And um, honestly, I, I haven't even checked out to see who all might be seeing this online, but uh, I'll just say hello to you too. And uh, welcome to Worshiping With Us. Um, I just want to remind you that uh, this is not so much a preaching service as it is a worship service. That's the word that's been used for this kind of thing for many, many years, and that states its purpose. It's serving God by worshiping Him. Our main thing today is to worship, to give glory to God. So. Let's be sure and do that as we sing and as we pray and all the other things we will that uh, we can do together who are gathered here today. So again, welcome. Let's pray now. Glory, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Lord, we just want to agree with the angels who said that for the very first time. By faith, we're here to worship you today. Thank you so much for this gathering. We just ask you to bless our fellowship in Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. Um, come on up. As we, you know, this, uh, this is the first hymn. I just want to mention something. This song has something very unusual in Christian hymns and Christian songs. Notice the last four stanzas I have uh, are God talking to us. So as we sing, let's be sure that we hear what he's saying. Thank you, Steve. Please stand if you can or would like to as we sing How Firm a Foundation. And the first page of your bulletin. The scripture this morning responsibly will be read from Galatians 16 through 25. Um, the women and the men take turns, and then the last sentence at the bottom will all say together. <clears throat> women, I say then, Walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Um, for our prayer time right now, I wondered if anyone had any praise or any prayer requests. Yes, Jessica. 
Yes. Dear Lord, we are so thankful that you have brought us here today together. We just thank you for the Sabbath that you've given us, the time that we can worship you and fellowship together. I thank you for this family of worshipers. Lord, I pray that um, you are with, will be with our country. We're going through so much turmoil. We pray that you will be with our leaders and pray that as we vote, uh, that we will vote for people that will um, do the best for our nation, um, that will also follow you. We also ask that you will um, be with us as we do our search for another place of worship or for another part of this building that we would worship in. I pray that you will guide us and show us where you want us to be. And Lord, we also ask that you will guide us in our search for a pastor. I pray that the, the right pastor is out there um, and that you will um, lead that pastor to us. Um, and we just look forward to that. We pray that you will be with Leland as he's meeting with the Foothills Church today. We just thank you for what they have meant to us and the help that they have been to us. And we know that they've been through a lot of struggles, health struggles and different things in, among their congregations and death in the family. We just pray that you will bless them and give them peace. Um, different ones have been shared with us today that are in need of your healing. Um, there's Monte and Michael and Jennifer and David Allen and Aurora and um, Phil um, and Dorothy. And they have different needs, different healings that they need. We just bring them to you, Lord, and ask for your healing. We ask that you will be with us the rest of our service today. And we just thank you in Jesus' name. Uh, this next song is You Are My Hiding Place. You'll notice the lyrics are short. It gets repeated a number of times and does a canon sort of a thing where it uh, one singer starts and another singer starts um, just shortly after. It's really fun. Uh, hope you enjoy it. And if you don't mind standing with me, if you can, to sing. A few weeks ago, we looked at, at a gospel song. It, that's in the Bible. It's also known as Psalm 32. Uh, please find that in your Bible. You're looking at it a little bit. We saw that Psalm 32 is actually set up uh, very much the way a lot of hymns and songs are set up today. They'll have maybe two or three stanzas and then a chorus at the end. Today we're going to look at uh, what may be the second stanza of this song, verses 5 through 11. Uh, this song, of course, was written by David, a gospel musician and songwriter. At least that's what he would be called today if he lived in Nashville. Oh, uh, he was also a shepherd, a soldier, and finally, king of Israel. But today we're thinking about David as a musician and songwriter. We would say he wrote praise songs that give glory to God. Of course, David also, I don't know if you know, David wrote different kinds of songs. For instance, he wrote some of those blues-type songs, you know, where he would, I'm just going to paraphrase a little bit, where he would sing, uh, Oh, I'm so sad, I'm so blue, 
because all my enemies are trying to kill me. He did write stuff like that, not quite those words. But mostly he wrote gospel songs, praise songs. And Psalm 32 is one of those. Now, the first part, I'll just review from last time. The first part of Psalm 32 is all about God forgiving our sins and, uh, and, and how confessing our sins is an important part of that. This is one of the first things we need to understand as Christians that our hope of eternal life is based on Jesus' death and resurrection, paying the penalty for our sin, conquering death, and knowing that our sins are forgiven. And so we confess these things. We agree with God about them. Well, that's all basic stuff, but we need to go on from there, as David did in Psalm 32. So let's just read now, starting at verse 6. Now, the uh, there are, you know, at least two King James versions that both say the same thing here. It'll, they start out, for this cause, which means, because this is true, or we could say, therefore. Some translations say, therefore. Uh, this psalm is actually set up like some of the New Testament letters, where he starts with a section of teaching, followed by a therefore, and then it tells what we need to do because the teaching is true. Teaching, followed by application. So, in Psalm 32, because the teaching about forgiveness of sin is true, therefore, well, let's read it. Verse 6. For this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely, in a flood of great waters, they shall not come near him. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. I will, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I guide you with my eye. Do not be like the horse or the mule which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with bit and bridle, else they will not come near you. Many sorrows shall, shall be to the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall, shall, shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord, and rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright heart. As a Christian, your sins have been forgiven, and you are clean before God. That's the good news in the first part of the psalm. But what if you sin again? Or what if you find your life full of trouble because you're a Christian? What if people start giving you a hard time because you've, you know, gotten into all that Jesus stuff? This can happen. And when it happens to new Christians, many of them are, are kind of blown away by it. You know, they weren't expecting trouble. They thought believing in Jesus was supposed to make life better, not worse. And sometimes they wonder, why are people giving me a hard time? And why am I still doing some of the same stupid things I did before. Eventually, these people will learn, uh, uh, as an old saying goes, Jesus never promised a pleasant journey, only a safe arrival. 
It, at first, it can be hard to endure the trouble that comes just because you're a Christian. This is a new kind of trouble, different from the old trouble. Well, maybe that's why the next part of this psalm starts out with God as a refuge and as a help in time of need. Now that God has forgiven our sins, now, in verses 6 and 7, God shows us that we can come to him for help in time of need. And most of the time, he works that out when we pray. So, in verse 6, everyone who is godly will pray. Now, I suppose God could bless us and rescue us when we don't pray. But pretty much, he has chosen prayer as the line of communication between him and us maybe even as more or less a requirement for his help when we need it. And there's, and there's a good reason for that. If you're in trouble, yes, you need God to come to your aid, to rescue you, but the relationship with him is more important than the rescue. And praying is part of the relationship, whether there's trouble or not. So, when it gets hard, we need to pray and find God to be a hiding place where we find protection. This is really a good picture here in verse 7, hiding. You know, hiding is not the same as running away like a criminal or a, or a naughty child does when, you know, trying to avoid getting caught. Hiding here is coming to God for help and protection. Now, earlier, um, we who were here today <laughs> sang a song that takes some of its words from verse 7. The song was called, You Are My Hiding Place. I'm I'm sorry those who are watching online didn't get to sing with us, but you can easily find the song on YouTube or wherever. It's called You Are My Hiding Place. Now, I'm guessing that maybe some of us who are here today didn't know that song before we sang it today. Am I right? Okay. Um, I hope you'll find a time to Listen to that song again. You know, some of the words obviously come from verse 7 here in Psalm 32. And in case you'd like to know, the rest of the words come from uh, Joel chapter 3, verse 10, and Psalm 56, verse 3. Isn't that something how scriptures can, can all, you know, from from all those places can be together in a song like this. But the important thing is the message and the promise in these words, and that's God's help and protection whenever we need that. That's something Christians need to learn. And there's another thing in uh, verses 8 and 9. Along with being forgiven, along with being protected by God, we need to learn to receive instruction from him and to discipline ourselves to obey him. It says here, I will instruct you. I will guide you. Uh, yes, that's, that's David, the songwriter, talking to us. But it's mainly God talking to us, instructing and guiding. Though God really is the author of the Bible, David was one of many writers. They say that as many as 40 people 
wrote different parts of the Bible. And through all of them, God instructs us in the way we should live. I guess you could say that that means we're all still in school. Even the oldest of us, even those who have been Christians the longest, still need to be taught the ways of living as a child of God. Uh, God the Holy Spirit is our teacher, and the Bible is the textbook. Or if you want to use a different picture, God is the inventor of human life. We are the users, and the Bible is the user manual. I used to write user manuals, so it's easy for me to see that picture of the Bible as a user manual. The, the, the purpose of the user instructions that, that I used to write was, was to tell people how to use software, to help them get through the uh, issues and the problems that, that everybody runs into sooner or later. If people don't read and follow the instructions, well, you can see how things can go wrong. What this is saying in Psalm 32 is that we need to listen to God's teaching because he knows what he's talking about, which means that we, we don't always know. Even though we've been forgiven of our sins, like we saw in the first part of the psalm, most of us still have some, well, you might say some crazy ideas about what we think life should be, and many of us don't want to listen to the good, solid instruction that's found in the Word of God. A good way to describe people like this is stubborn. Stubborn as a mule. Oh, that's the picture here in verse 9. A stubborn mule or horse. It says, the only way this animal can be controlled is by bit and bridle. It, it has to be led around everywhere, doing only what it's made to do because it has no self-discipline. The bit and bridle help the rider to, to you know, steer <laughs> the animal he's riding on. Or if, if you're not actually riding, you can hold the reins and, and walk in front leading the horse wherever you want it to go. And that can be hard to do if the animal is stubborn. Now, you might expect that kind of behavior from a horse or a mule, but it's kind of sad that many people are like that. Many Christians are like that. Don't be that way, it says here. It's one of the reasons we have the Bible is to teach us the way to live, like we saw in verse 8. But we have to grow up and do what it says without somebody leading us around by bit and bridle every step we take, and even to do this when no one is watching. As we read earlier in uh, Galatians 5, one of the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. As the Holy Spirit teaches us, he also helps us to be disciplined so that we can obey the Word, even without the bit and bridle. Like so many other things that we read about in the Bible, this one is a matter of growing up and becoming mature. Uh, you could say that stubbornness and rebellion are, are kind of like, like leftovers 
from the old sinful nature, the old way of living. And baby Christians are still going to do some things the old way. In Ephesians, Paul talked about Christians being being tossed around by waves, blown here and there, easily deceived. And he called those Christians infants. But we can't stay like that. Babies shouldn't be infants the rest of their lives. We have to grow up. Psalm 32 says our sins have been forgiven. We need to confess, to agree with God about who we are as sinners saved by grace. The psalm promises us help in time of trouble. Promise and promises protection from danger. And it tells us about how God teaches us through his word and about our need to grow in discipline so that we can obey. Can you see how, how all this fits into the life of a Christian? Seems to me this psalm could have been in the New Testament because it describes how a Christian needs to live. But remember that originally Psalm 32 was a song. <laughs> Today we might call it a praise song, or as I'm calling it, a gospel song. We could sing it with the words, you know, printed in the bulletin or, or you know, videos even up on the screen if we wanted to. And this would be one of the better praise songs because it's got some good, solid Bible content. So, because it's a praise song, it's, it's right that it ends with rejoicing and praise in verse 11. If this song was up on the screen, you, you, you could divide the first 10 verses into, uh, as I said earlier, maybe a couple of stanzas, five verses each, and then verse 11 could be the chorus at the end of each stanza, something like that. Because all these things in verses 1 through 10 are true, and here they are. Forgiveness, confession, refuge, protection, teaching, self-control, and obedience. If these things are happening in our lives, we rejoice and we sing. That's the idea here. This last song we're going to sing is, is based on the blessing that the high priest Aaron gave to the people of Israel, plus a, plus a whole bunch of other words that are added to it. It's a blessing for us, too. Let's sing. You guys stood and I didn't even have to ask. Thanks. <laughs> um, the song, like Steve mentioned, is The Blessing. Mm -hmm. 